Hey guys, Gaia Gaius here. So, it took me only four weeks to make instead of, yeesh, really? It took me six weeks to make part two? Oh my god. Well, anyways, we're back again with Gundam Sentinel Part 3. I'll have links down below to the playlist that'll help you get caught up with my retelling and analysis of Gundam Sentinel. So, where we last left off, Task Force Alpha, being victorious in their first attack on the new decides, is given news that Federation reinforcements are en route to help them. However, this force, led by Commander Ayano, betrayed the Federation and joins forces with the new decides. Left with no other choice, Task Force Alpha is joined by allies from the moon to recapture Pezun before Aeono can make contact with the other traitors. However, during the assault, our heroes learn in the nick of time that the asteroid they've been sent to recapture has been left for them as a trap by their enemies. The new decides using a nuclear warhead, destroying the entire asteroid in order to escape. With the heroes pursuing the new decides to the City of Airs, Task Force Alpha attempts to ambush them from orbit before the enemy can prepare the city for an attack. However, not realizing that the city, the new decides, and the forces led by Yayano have all formed up, and their now combined forces have turned their plans for an ambush on their heads. With Task Force Alpha now trapped and facing insurmountable numbers of enemy forces as they're surrounded from all sides up in Luna's orbit, the heroes must now fight for survival as the skies above Air City become a battleground. With the new decides unveiling their ultimate weapon, the gargantuan Gundam Mark V, and with their leader personally destroying nearly a dozen of their own mobile suits on his own, the heroes must now face this nightmare of an opponent. Now, let us continue with Gundam Sentinel and dive right into the battle for heirs with Part 3. All images and characters are owned by their respective companies and creators. Chapter 6. The Neros spot the enemy approaching. Countless new decides mobile suits, all painted in blue, all rushing towards them from all around. We've been tricked. They fire their signal flares, with their purple flashes alerting the entire fleet of their coming. Ryu is in the S Gundam's G Cruiser mode. He spots the flare, but it's too late. Ayano can see the flash as well from 1500 meters away. He orders his ships to fire a forward barrage. Countless missiles arc towards Ryu's second wave of suits from afar in a closing palm-like formation from all around them. Ayano watches from the bridge. He knew the commander in charge of this attack, Heathrow. Too bad the fool is such a scatterbrain. He clearly doesn't have the ability to command a fleet of his own, unlike himself. Seems now is better than any other time to test him. He can recall the kind of man his student was. Never before did he encounter a man such as Heathrow. The thought giving him mixed emotions. If Heathrow possessed the skill to beat him, then he deserved the reputation he earned. The man saw Heathrow like a son in many ways, someone he'd hoped would outshine him in years. But now, now is not the time to show mercy. He knows the commander's weaknesses. He's followed regulations far too closely in his career something that Ayano knows to take advantage of. Over with Heathrow, he receives the report that their entire first wave has been wiped out, the shock nearly making him freeze in terror. However, he manages to steer himself. He orders all mobile suit forces from the attack group to return to the fleet and have all ships in their formation to launch Minotsky warheads immediately. Mannings, hearing this, grows concerned as he hears the orders. Minotsky warheads? These weapons are prohibited by the Granada Treaty. You need top-level clearance to fire those. Minovsky war Warheads, for those who don't know, are essentially anti-beam dispersal missiles. They release a highly dense field of Minovsky particles that inhibit long-range beam weapons. These missiles are prohibited as the residual particles that are released were deemed as far too harmful for the environment. Highly dense Minovsky particle fields take an extremely long time to dissipate, and these weapons were seen by many as far too harmful for the Earth. Mannings is finding it strange that Heathrow is ordering the usage of them, being a man who is known for being a stickler for the rules. This order to release the missiles, however, comes too late. Ayano's barrage cleaves through another nine of the fleet's mobile suits. All that's left of their mobile suit force sent to attack the city of 30 is now nothing but 12 units remaining. They receive a transmission from Ryu. The mobile suits he's encountered are all not moving. They're dummies. The units sent towards their fleet aren't real. Heathrow and Mannings ask, then where are the real ones? They soon then realize that the real units, the ones they'd expected to attack them, are all at the city at this point. Over with Ryu, he's using his beam weapons on low power to destroy the inflatable dummies. Crypt soon flies over though, and asks him, what the hell is he doing? Can't you see? As he blasts another one. Ryu asks, 
asks about the others, but Crypt says that the first wave has been completely wiped out. There's no one here. If there's no one here, then we could just go and take out their ships. That's our mission, right? As the two stand around, Chung sends them a message. Hey, idiots! If you guys aren't doing anything productive, come help us draw the enemy away. With Ryu and Crypt looking over and seeing Chung's team heading to commence their attack, they soon realize that they need to shift their objectives. With most of their forces wiped out, they're gonna have to change their attack plan. They can't attack the fleet now. They have to assist with taking the city. Now, before we get into this next segment, there's something I want to bring up that I didn't mention at all during my earlier videos, and that is something that Sentinel really brings out of left field that I wouldn't expect, yet something very interesting when it comes to mobile suit combat, and that is the use of cyber warfare on enemy forces. You see, if you recall from the first video I made on Sentinel, I had mentioned that Task Force Alpha has been making use of stolen combat data from the new decides that Federation agents had recovered prior to this conflict. However, if you also recall, I mentioned that the new decides had falsified some of it. Well, it wasn't only falsified. What do I mean by this? Well, you might want to pay close attention to this next part. As Chung sets a new objective for the team, to go and attack the city, he activates his unit's integrated maneuver propulsion and control system, which essentially acts as an automatic target locking system built into the mobile suit, one that allows the mobile suit to move and fly towards a predetermined position. However, as he sets the system to have the Nero prepared to head down to the surface, a series of strange flashings and scrolling messages flare up all over Chung's monitor. Shame on you, it says. It plays out this text message over and over again. You see, the combat data given to Task Force Alpha was allowed to leak out. Why? Because Tosh Cray had the data rigged with a logistic bomb, a virus that he planned to have triggered for this battle. As I read this part, the reveal took me for a loop, but I began to look back on everything. This moment really shows just how much of an intelligent threat Tosh Cray is. He has been 10 steps ahead of Task Force Alpha this whole time. When he knew that it was only a matter of time before the Federation sent an elite force to deal with them at Paizun, and knowing their asteroid fortress would not last forever as a staging ground, Tosh Cray planned his next moves in advance. Knowing that the forces at Air City would be insufficient, which, I mean, yeah, they all got a bunch of outdated warships and GMs protecting the place, he set up, as part of his leak, a virus that would give their forces an edge over their opponents. However, the new decides now have a much larger amount of unexpected allies with them, and thus, Tosh Cray has somewhat overlooked this original plan. This virus, even though Chung has set it off, wasn't done at the intended moment that Tosh wanted it to go off at. So, yeah, this moment with the computer virus kind of comes out of nowhere, but honestly, it leads to one of the coolest moments leading up. So, let's keep it going. The data surge shuts down Chung's Nero and his wingmen's. His unit becomes dead in space beginning to plummet to the surface of the moon at a breakneck speed. Chung, being unable to move as the IMPC glitches out and his suit begins to become locked in freefall, he tries to maintain manual control. But in order to do so, he has to reboot his suit and switch to manual as he descends. His wingmen are screaming. He's unable to help them as they too are falling thanks to this virus. Ryu watches as they fall. He turns his head and can see them. Dozens of them. Ryu decides mobile suits. They're coming. Chung's a sitting duck. He has to help them, but Ryu isn't helping. He watches as Chung's suit is frozen still and falling to the lunar surface. What the hell is going on? Then it happens. The ringing in his ears again. This time, the sound becomes a bit clearer. A voice. A woman's voice. The voice. It ponders. Shit. Not good. Situation worsening. A crisis is approaching. They are companions. Humans? Is the best choice to help? To fight? He's fighting to prolong the lives of his companions, even though he himself has not suffered as they have. The pain of these humans. I can't possibly understand it. Thus, is this... is this humanity? Ryu curses out, and manages to wrestle the beam rifle from the S Gundam, aiming his weapon at the enemy's suits approaching. Chung can't get his suit to fire. All he can get working is the enemy detection system. He's not dying here. As he continues to fall, he can't fight back as the enemy fires at him. He knows he's screwed, but strangely, he's saved. The S Gundam defends them as they descend. Why is he protecting him? He thought he was a coward.
coward. Why would he risk his life for him? The S Gundam fires on the approaching wave of enemies, the Zeta Plus duo and the Faz trio joining in. These rookies, they're all trying to save him. They're working together. It's incredible. Within seconds, the combined mass of firepower from all six mobile suits manages to down every single one of their pursuers. As Chung manages to get his system back online, Chung thanks them. Ryu says he owes him one, and he and their team re-enter high orbit. The mission is a bust, but they've saved everyone they could. We cut over to Heathrow, and a communications officer tells them their attack was a failure. Should they have their remaining escort forces go to retrieve them? They're low on fuel. With a grunt, Heathrow nods, but as he does so, a new idea becomes more clear to him. He sees something. No. Wait, hold on a second. I see it now. Heathrow understands now. The enemy's plans. He won't be tricked. Not by him. Mannings asks why they can't retrieve them. Ryu and the others are sitting ducks out there. But Heathrow says no. The moment they send their forces to go get them, Ayano will immediately attempt to take the rest of them out. They can't allow him to seize an opportunity away from them. This leaves Mannings in a state of cautious worry. What could he be planning? Over with Brave Cod, the Gundam Mark V has returned to the Kilimanjaro, Brave himself being extremely pleased with the machine's performance. He managed to take out nine enemy mobile suits with it by himself. He asks Tosh about the status of the others. Tosh then says they have good news and bad news. The good news is that Tosh's Zeku Ein Squadron has returned and resupplied. Once they're out again, they'll be able to return to the battlefield to defend the airspace around airs. Commander Ayano, as well, has dealt with the enemy's attempt at an ambush, so they've got the advantage so far when it comes to the defense of the city. However, that's only the good news. The bad news is that the enemies that attacked them were not from the main lunar defense fleet. The commander of this force has baffled him. He actually attempted to land his forces onto Luna's surface. Tosh dispatched a third wave to intercept them, but their entire force was wiped out. Brave then asks about their planned viral attack. He asks if the enemy has cracked the code. Tosh himself says unfortunately yes. However, things could still play out well for them. Since the enemy can't land their forces onto the moon's surface, that would mean their only option for defeating them would be orbital bombardment to the city itself. If the enemy resorts to it, the destruction of heirs could be just the right catalyst for the new decides to rally other forces to their cause. Brave thinks on it. It might be just what they need to found their coalition of lunar cities like Tosh dreams of. As the two talk, they receive a message from a young officer. Brave needs to come to the bridge immediately. He asks why the young man seems so frantic. The enemy, a large fleet, has appeared. The main lunar fleet seems to have returned. Over with Ryu, the S Gundam is defending the four remaining Neros who've been locked into Luna's orbit. The Fazes are providing surveillance, while the Zeta Pluses head the formation. Ryu demands to know why it is that they can't retrieve any of their other survivors. But Chunk says that out of the four of them, there are only ten of them left. Perhaps their fleet is under attack, and that's why they are unable to send rescue. Without orders, perhaps the best plan is to head back with the fuel they've got. But Ryu, however, thinks it's best to stay here. What if they go back and there's nothing left of their fleet? They'd have nowhere to turn to. But Chung says he's weird for thinking that. It's the only real option they have right now. But Ryu says it's not like he's any less the same than him. As the two bicker, the voice of Alice can overhear their conversation. Ryu. He's strange. Chung as well. They have such abnormal traits. All of them are strange. All of these people are soldiers. To her, an AI, she hears them both call each other weird. Are all soldiers like this? Abnormal? And by extension, all of humanity? Warfare and combat are strange by this logic as well. As the AI's thoughts dwell on it, she comes to a conclusion. Perhaps all humans are all insane. As the two still bicker, several pings appear on the sensors. Another wave is approaching to finish them off. They're closing in fast, but Chung sees the readings. They're not enemies. Over with Heathrow, he prepares for the worst. More ships. Ayano is preparing to deal the final blow, no doubt. The ships on their sensors are closing in. However, an awestruck communications officer shouts over to him. The fleet that's approaching, it's not Ayano's. It's theirs. It's huge! The three lead ships appear on the screen. It's the Federation. It's the main fleet. The Federation, after hearing of the chaos that was going on, has sent its main space fleet from Penta to aid them. They've been flying at max speed to catch up with them. The tide is finally turning in their favor. The chapter ends with the fleet regrouping 
and the amazing news leading to cheers throughout Task Force Alpha. The Federation's main fleet has arrived to help. They've even sectioned off another four ships to create another task force to support them. Task Force Beta. Heathrow has briefed the main fleet's flagship, the Nagato, on their mission to attack heirs. And with them understanding the situation, they agree to aid them. A new mission is about to begin in two days. A plan to deal with heirs, the new decides, and Ayano will begin. Operation Eagles Fall. With Task Force Alpha withdrawing and resupplying, and with Task Force Beta providing new weapons and equipment, the battle for Air's city and all of those engaging in it begin for a second battle. On the Pegasus 3, warning alarms blare. All crew members are prepped with normal suits for immediate action. With this mission, both task forces will be attempting to break through the new decides and establish their much needed beachhead on the surface of the moon, while the Federation's main fleet will be tasked with engaging and destroying Ayano's forces. They're hoping that with the main fleet engaging Ayano, it will cause a large enough number of the new decides to divert their forces away from the two task forces trying to slip in. With a final countdown from the navigation officer, the mission begins immediately, every ship flying at maximum speed towards Air City, each ship firing simultaneously in three-shot bursts as they pass each of their designated firing lines, igniting the skies above the city in a sea of beam trails and explosions. Over with the two task forces, the Nero's and Task Force Beta's own personal mobile suit escort the Nouvelle GM3s as they're called, ready their landing equipment as they race toward the surface of the moon, both groups of mobile suits flying together in a single formation. As they head towards their destination, they spot them, five ships, the Kilimanjaro and its escort cruisers. As the two sides approach, Heathrow gives the order, open fire, concentrate all fire on their main ship. As they attempt to hit them with the main guns, Brave Cod and his men can feel the shockwave as the energy streams rip past them, clipping a hole in their ship's stern. As Brave struggles to get back into his seat, himself being thrown from it by the shockwave, Tosh says that it seems the enemy appears to have begun its main assault. Brave himself agrees. He thought they'd be tangled up with Ayano, but it seems he's wrong. He never expected a fight from two sides. He then asks one of the bridge officers, how are their own mobile suits defending them? It seems they've only been attacked from one side. Their Zeku Ains have engaged the enemy's landing party. Brave orders that they return fire immediately, but the damage reports keep flooding in. Those hits to their ship have dealt significant damage to their hull. They've lost crew to the vacuum, and they can't seal enough of the breach. Reaches. A second barrage takes out several more of their crew as they attempt to close off more of the ship. As the ship gets hit with that second bombardment, the Kilimanjaro's weapons go offline. Their ship's controls are damaged too. They've lost control of half the ship. As Cod becomes enraged, he orders the evacuation. All available pilots follow him. Tosh too. They're going out there. We're destroying that fleet right now. But Tosh tries to calm him. He's their commander. They should return to the city, reorganize a better defense. If the enemy attacks them there, attacking the city, they'll secure their long-term goals. As he tries to convince him of this, Brave says no. Tosh, I think you've known me for long enough to realize I'm not as smart as you are. If I wish to do battle, then let me do it. No one holds me back. The one who's better to serve as our leader is you. Go. Head back to Ayers and assist Josh. He's gonna need your help. With a light punch to his chest, Brave leaps away from Tosh, heading towards the mobile suit deck, and temporarily placing the command of the new decides in Tosh's hands. Brave Cod makes it to the mobile suit deck. He launches immediately. Brave Cod, Gundam Mark V, launching. He blasts off into the void, a small group of Zeku Ains following him into battle. As he leaves, Tosh stands in the hangar. A massive mobile suit stands before him. He asks the technician if the suit can be used. The officer says that the unit needs much more time to fine tune. However, with the adjustments they've made to it so far, it should be able to land him on the moon. With Tosh becoming briefly concerned on the word should. Regardless, he tells the technicians to get to the lifeboats. The remainder of their ships in this fleet will withdraw to help Ayano. He will see the rest of them down below. Air's city awaits. With him closing the cockpit and the mobile suit starting up, Tosh launches from the Kilimanjaro in the last mobile suit that remained on their flagship, the colossal and extremely powerful Sekou's Y. The new decides retreating and to go and aid Ayano, Task Force Alpha begins its assault on the Air's city defense system. At the 
city, Josh, has prepared the city's defense team. Two former Titans mobile suit carriers have taken up positions around the city's entrance. Josh may be in command of this group, but the soldiers he's commanding are not, in a way, aces like him. The troops under his own wing are cadets from the Air City Academy. He tells them all to listen up. Don't waste your ammo. Wait until the enemy is within half of your firing range to fire. The enemy is approaching from above, so they won't have cover. However, they will be traveling much faster than they expected. With a cheer from his rookies, Josh thinks they're ready. He recalls that the members of Task Force Alpha are rookies as well. With this defense, he's banking on the fact that they too don't have the same experience as him. However, he worries, what if this task force is comprised of new types? But if they are, could they really turn the tide of this war? As he thinks, he begins to get triggered. He remembers his reasons for joining the Federation forces. It was all just an attempt to gain advantages for his political career as it took off. Seems like now though, with the rise of people like new types, he's not gonna get anything out of this. No glory and no recognition. Something Josh is so accustomed to, but now sees he's dependent on. He hopes that with this battle, he won't have to worry about it. Over with Task Force Alpha, the main assault force of Nero's and Nouvelle Gym 3s have begun their assault. However, our heroes have made it to the surface beforehand. They managed to eliminate the enemy's units that were planning to ambush the main group as they made Moonfall. Ryu himself is once again flying in the S Gundam's G Cruiser mode. He shouts over to Tex as he spots an enemy squad hiding under a cliff as he flies by. Tex spots them too. They fire together and obliterate three GMs who were intending to sneak up on them, all members of Josh's defense force. The cadets freak out. They have Gundams! Josh tries to reassure them that the enemy are all rookies like them not even new types, but this doesn't seem to help. He knows it too. These opponents have gained strength since Peizun. Even if he got his men to do everything he told them to do, it would still be too difficult to achieve victory. Regardless, he tries to hold a strong face as the enemy assault rages on. As the fighting continues, we cut over to Brave in the Gundam Mark V. He's blasting his way towards Ayono's fleet at maximum speed. He once again releases the incoms from his back. Brave flies into the enemy fleet and immediately decimates another nine mobile suits with just two of those incoms. He laughs maniacally. Cowards! Is there no one here who dares challenge the Mark V? With another unit exploding and taking a cruiser with it, Brave is fully enraptured in the Gundam's power. With Task Force Alpha's main assault crumbling, the FAZ Squadron receives a distress call from one of the forward mobile suit pilots, asking them to try and take out the Mark V from long range. Crypt wants to help, but he has no combat data on this machine. The pilot yells at him telling him to request it from the Pegasus 3. Crypt gets annoyed, bothered that everyone is asking for his help, but nonetheless, he requests the data. As he gets it back, he jokingly chuckles. He's got a Gundam 2, huh? But as he reads it, he doesn't understand what the whole deal is with this suit. He's never seen an Incom system before. He doesn't even know what the model number of this suit even means. It worries him, but he regardless flies his squadron over towards the area the Mark V is approaching from. Form a field of fire around this enemy with your missile. We're dead if we get in range of those incom things. As the three units close in, the three of them fire their chest-mounted missiles in unison, all towards the Mark V. Brave laughs as he sees the missiles approach. He jerks on the controls, his unit exerting a powerful force of Gs as it evades the approaching projectiles, his body aching as he gets crushed into his seat. The missiles hit, though, shaking his suit as a few stray micro-rockets bounce off the Mark V's chest. As he rockets downward, his eyes become bloodshot, the G-force is nearly knocking him out cold. The Gundam Mark V's own missile pods rip off from its body from the exertion of G-force forces onto the machine. As he fights his way through it and begins to regain consciousness, we cut over to Crypt. He thinks they got him. The fact the machine was hit by the missiles and at the moment the unit looks disabled, they think that they got him. As we turn over to Brave, he soon realizes he broke a tooth with how hard he clenched his teeth with all those G-forces. Despite being an expert pilot, nothing short of a new type would be enough to properly handle this suit in the field. Regardless, Brave fights on. As he feels and sees the missing tooth in his reflection, Brave curses at the three Gundams. He blasts towards them as fast as he can. Crypt and the others, thinking they've taken them out, immediately see the Mark V's engines ignite, the unit blasting its way towards Grissom and Aldrin in a blazing stream of blue fire. Even though he is taking some significant damage from their missile 
frontal attack, with them even managing to disable the unit's incoms, that doesn't put a stop to Brave. He evades their shots with insane accuracy, switching his machine's beam sabers to beam cannon mode. In a surge of rage, Brave charges towards the three of them. As he flies towards them, he sees the confusion in the trio's stances. As he ceases to evade and closes the gap, he immediately rushes Grism's unit in the front and blasts him at close range. Crypt trying to get his wingman to evade, only for Grism to explode as his fastest reactor ignites from the point-blank shot. As Crypt and Aldrin try to pull back, Crypt can hear as Grism as well is blown to pieces from behind them. Aldrin yells, Bastard! He killed him! Aldrin then rushes in, with Crypt yelling at him trying to stop him, telling him to retreat but the man is too angry. He blasts off towards the Mark V. It is here that Brave sees the enemy unit's strategy, keep their distance and engage from afar. He sees that the enemy has incredible firepower. However, he sees the fault in his opponents, in the fact that one of them is rushing him at close range with such a heavily armored machine. He then says it, there's no escape for you. Without hesitation, Brave switches his shoulder cannons back into beam sabers and rushes towards the two remaining phases. With a hefty cleave to the torso, Aldrin's phase as well is split in two. The man screaming for his mother as the unit's cockpit is bisected by the Mark V's blade. Crypt is frozen. His wingmen, both of them, they're dead. He turns his suit around, pivoting in zero-g. Despite losing his wingman, Crypt unleashes a burst of fire that raises the gap between him and Cod. Even Brave himself is impressed with the amount of weapons he's using to fill the gap, but it's not enough. The Mark V is still able to catch up with him. With a careful and methodical swing, the Mark V cleaves off Crypt's right arm. The Mega Beam Launcher still charging and firing as the weapon tries to shoot Brave from point blank. With a sinister grin, Brave now sees it as his time to retreat. He engages his backup propulsion system and jets back to the moon. Aeno's forces giving Lee all clear as they make their withdrawal, Brave himself returning to the surface to regroup with the others. Over with Crypt, his suit isn't destroyed yet. He pulls on the ejection lever just in time for the unit's escape pod to jettison out of the suit, the man being left in a state of misery as he feels the guilt of being unable to save his teammates from being slaughtered. As his pod floats away, the last of the three full armor double Zeta units explode. The lifeline for Task Force Alpha's defense is severed, and the enemy has escaped once again. After Crypt is rescued, we cut over to Ryu, who's just heard the news about the Faz trio. Ryu, asking Mannings if Crypt's okay, in which he's told that he's fine, however the others didn't make it, he learns that the enemy has a Gundam as well. As Ryu laments the loss of his comrades, Mannings gives him new instructions. The Gundam Mark V was severely damaged in its fight with the Faz trio. With the loss of those three suits, it drastically reduces their fleet's combat abilities. Ryu, you and the S Gundam are the only unit that is properly equipped to handle an opponent like this. The S Gundam's objective is to intercept that Gundam, but Ryu, however, is bothered with Manning's attitude, hearing the man's monotone voice describe the deaths of his comrades. Ryu becomes enraged. Two of their teammates are dead, and three of their most powerful suits were destroyed, yet he shows no emotion. Why can't you show something, you freak? But Manning's remains stern, because there must come a time when you must discard those emotions. I've lost far more friends in life in the one year war than in this conflict, and in war, there is no time to be upset. Save the rage you feel for your enemies. You and the S Gundam are the only ones who can do this, so do it for your friends. With those words, Ryu finally listens to him. He transforms his suit into mobile suit mode. Mannings. Ugh. He's right. He now sees his mission and readies to put an end to the Mark V's warpath. Through his will alone, he must do it. However, as the suit waits at the ready, Ryu has still yet to realize that his own will is not the only one inside this machine. And with Alice hearing Ryu and Manning's conversation, she still can't seem to comprehend it. The emotions of soldiers. Chapter 8. Ryu spots the Mark V as it descends towards the lunar surface. You bastard! You'll pay for killing my friends! Alice herself analyzes this statement. Friends, the most important thing. You must have revenge for our hurt friends. But who are my friends? Ryu is one, one hiding inside of me. He is my friend, and so I must protect him. If he is hurt, 
I need to take revenge for him. This is a pact we must make as friends. But is it the right thing to do if it means hurting others? You see, Alice is having a hard time understanding human behavior. Remember, she isn't a person herself, and thus conflict is a confusing thing to her. However, the more we see her think and understand Ryu, the more she'll learn what it means to be human herself. As once again, the whole goal of Alice is to achieve this higher level of emotional sentience. As she begins to become more active in these fights, we'll start to see her make that transition from incapable level of understanding to full-fledged humanity. Anyways, that's one of the things I wanted to bring up. Cause up until this point, Alice has been pretty dormant, but things are going to change very soon for her. And I thought it was the best time as ever to talk about her character arc going forward as it becomes incredibly important in our finale. Anyways, the S Gundam has now transformed into the XS. It takes aim from the surface with its beam smart gun, Ryu managing to spot the Mark V and managing to acquire a lock as it enters Luna's atmosphere. As Brave himself descends, his unit's shield is being used to protect him as he enters the moon's atmosphere. As Brave disengages the shield, which has already expended its remaining vernier fuel to enter said atmosphere, a beam round rings out that blows the shield apart as it separates from the Gundam's body. Brave is stunned as the explosion from the shield rips across his suit with a shockwave, Ryu becoming amazed as he sees the Gundam escape the blast without a scratch. As he watches it, he mutters a word of amazement as he watches the Gundam Mark V fly down. Incredible. The single word actually catches the ears of Alice, who upon hearing it becomes a little confused. I don't understand. He's praising the target of his revenge? Why? I don't understand. There's so many things about humans that I don't understand. This one instance could be an abnormality, but then again, humans seem to always be so inconsistent in battle. It's abnormal. I was created for battle. I was created to be human. So have I become a part of that abnormality? As Alice thinks to herself, Ryu manages to message Mannings. The Gundam managed to evade his ambush. He then asks where the suit's landing position will be. He's gonna be chasing him down right now. He's gonna smoke that guy even if he has to use a nuke. Manning says that the suit's trajectory will land him far beyond their battle line and inside the enemy's territory. He also brings up how silly it is to contemplate using nukes on a single mobile suit, both the legal and tactical reasons. With the roll of his eyes, and knowing he has to do this himself, Ryu blasts off into the air, giving chase to the Mark V as it descends. We cut to the defense of the city, and the occupants of the government building are watching the battle from the building's observation dome, just two kilometers away from the air's spaceport. A single mobile suit has managed to slip its way past their lines. As the GM3s guarding their line raise their rifles, they hear a voice over the comms. It's Tosh. He's arrived with the Zeku's Y. He requests to speak with Mayor Pinefield. He's brought into the dome which, keep in mind, the entirety of spans 30 kilometers in size. The guard GMs take him through the underground mass driver system, used for the transportation of cargo throughout the city, as well as for the launching of cargo shipments to Earth. He's been entrusted with the Zwei. It's the only one they've got, and it's incredibly powerful, and he's not leaving it out there. Once he reaches the office, he's greeted to a beautiful hall of cypress wood. The man is indeed wealthy, it seems. Tosh is allowed in and is greeted by the mayor, now brandishing a military uniform. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Tosh Cray of the New Decides. It's an honor. So, you finally come, the man says. The man asks about this coalition idea. However, the mayor himself asks that they do away with the formalities. We need to quickly clarify the situation that this is made for them. The mayor then brings up a map, displaying the entire battlefield. Currently, their entire defense force is comprised of four groups. The white team, led by Josh and comprised of their cadets. The red team, comprised of the elderly veteran soldiers, the blue team made of the Titans remnants, and finally the green team, former soldiers with existing records. Tosh himself is grieved with what they're doing, even the elderly are being sent out to fight. Regardless, the mayor says that this is the will of their citizens. Ever since the days of Air's founding, their people have expressed a deep desire to fight for Earth. If they lose today, then Earth will no longer be controlled by Earthnoids. It's a shame, but if they are all sacrificed, they know that other cities will carry on their mission. He's hoping they send reinforcements to help them in this dire time of need, and now that he has seen the determination of the new decides firsthand, 
He gladly believes they will do the same and fight off the invaders to the end. However, Tosh himself says no, he will not accept that offer. Pinefield asks why, and Tosh says that the citizens of Ayers are religiously devoted to the Earth. They do not share the same ideology as the new decides. The new decides will never forget that they came from Mother Earth. However, heirs, the way they are, are the kind who will be seen as the last vestige of Earth and its old politics, and the new decides will be themselves the ones who will guard their tombstone. The people of Ayers are different. Your existence and your beliefs are nothing but a reminder of the Earth Federation's failures. Because of this, a sacrifice like the one that Kaiser proposes will not be seen as a single powerful one. They have to let the world know how courageously they're fighting against them. Even if the new decides all die here, the people of Ayers, if they truly want what they desire, will have to die fighting on Earth's soil. The mayor hears his words, his eyes still transfixed on the display of the battle. He sees it, he understands it. Perhaps the destruction of this place was inevitable. This place, Ayers, is one of the only places left that still has the purity of the space noy desire. The desire to come home someday. This place is a symbol, a symbol in its purest form of the way things are between the Earth and the space noids. But to tell you the truth, even if your dream of this lunar coalition becomes a reality, there will still be space noids who will undergo the same tragedies as they are going through now. This inability to understand one another's differences. Just as the people of Ayers believe their cause is just, there will still be others who will think theirs is more so. Only history can decide in the end who was right or wrong. Tosh understands, but that this place has to serve as a reminder of how the Federation is seen by all. This place needs to demonstrate the justice that Earthnoids proclaim. He knows the idea of this coalition will no doubt succeed, and with that sentiment, the mayor hopes so too. But as this current crisis grows, he doesn't know yet if he can admit it. Tosh then looks down at the city's map. He sees a long, thin line stretching out towards the city's outskirts. Tosh can see what the mayor is planning. He worries that this path still works, but the mayor says that it won't matter. path may be old, but it will still work for what they have in mind. As the two begin to reevaluate their defensive plan, we cut over to Josh Offshore. Task Force Alpha's Zeta Plus duo have made their arrival with the third wave of their suits near the southwest end of the city. With them entering the battlefield, Josh's defense team is now up against the ropes. They managed to hold off the first wave well, but with the arrival of the second and third mobile suit groups from the enemy, Josh begins to order the cadets of his team to withdraw. However, Josh, despite his training as an instructor, is still finding it hard to rally and command his team of rookies as he gives them commands. As he does so, the young pilots begin to protest, the young cadets wishing to stay and fight. But Josh says no, they can't. They can't keep hurling themselves at the enemy. There are too many enemy units, but the young men still refuse. They aren't afraid to die. However, Josh steadies them. They can't just recklessly throw away their lives. If they want to die in battle, it'll have to be in the right place and at the right time. With Josh and his team making their way towards the mountains north northwest of the city, they prepare for a counterattack. As they get into position, crouching against the lunar cliffs and ridges, they spot a group of enemy mobile suits bunny hopping with their boosters towards them, one of Task Force Beta's new Vil'jim 3 squads. Their jumps getting them far as the moon's weakened gravity begins to bring them back down. As they land, Josh's team opens fire, catching some of the Jim 3s in mid-flight and blowing them to bits. Over with those GM3 pilots, the leader machine traces their line of fire and spots Josh's squad's position. Ambush! They're hiding in those rocks! With the pilot himself cursing and wondering where the hell their reinforcements are. Where the hell are those Gundams? The two sides open fire simultaneously, with one of Josh's squad mates getting blown to pieces as their Jim 3 is blasted the moment they try to get up and reposition. The blast sending the entire unit of rookies into a panic. However, as the two sides exchange fire, Brave enters the final stage of his landing sequence. He can see from below the squad of rookie pilots under Josh's wing trying to hold the line. Damn, the enemy has gotten much closer than expected, he says as he spits more blood out from his mouth from his broken teeth. As he descends, Ayers City receives the signal of the Mark V. However, the unit's landing 
trajectory will have it arrive just behind the enemy's approaching line. Tosh sends the order to Josh to clear a path and defend the Mark V as it lands so that Brave can be retrieved. With Josh commanding his troops, telling them to protect the Gundam, the pilots begin to become more excited. The mention of the very name of their own Gundam reinvigorating the young men as they move towards their new objective. Over with the Gym 3s with Task Force Beta, they detect the arrival of the Mark V as it's covered by the enemy's approaching suppressing fire. Only a single mobile suit? Blow it to bits! But as they begin to realize that it's the Mark V, they begin to freak out. The Mark V immediately slicing down GM after GM as Josh's team wipes out the remaining units trying to flee. With Brave spotting Josh's defensive linemen caught in a pincer from the remaining GMs, he leaps with his boosters at maximum thrust, landing just at the other side of the rocks and out of the enemy's firing range. With the two reuniting, Josh notices the immense damage the Mark V has taken, with Brave himself being amazed with the skills of Josh's troops despite the fact they are all merely cadets. He tells them not to push themselves too hard, then asking Josh about their current situation. Where is Tosh? Josh says that he's over at the central government's headquarters, arranging the city's defenses. He says with their current situation, they still have the ability to hold out for their reinforcements from the other lunar cities. However, Brave is starting to see that the idea of them coming to aid them is beginning to look more overly optimistic. With Brave deciding to go and meet with Josh and the mayor, the Gundam Mark V blasts away, asking Josh to please hold out for just a little longer. As he leaves, the Mark V begins its journey to the main city dome. However, three coursing energy streams strike as he heads out. Three of Josh's GMs explode as the Zeta Plus duo and Ryu's excess Gundam rocket in pursuit of him as soon as he jumps. Don't let him get away, Ryu yells to the pair. As they begin to chase him, Josh orders the remainder of his team to protect the Mark V as it retreats, his Zeku eyes blasting off in an attempt to shoot the enemy trio from the rear. As his mobile suit jets off into the air, Within a split second of taking off, Josh fires a beam round that manages to blast Texas wingman Sigmund in his wings, knocking the Zeta Plus out of the air as it spirals out of control. Tex cries out over the comms, Sigmund, he's hit! But Ryu pulls his attention back to their attack. He only took a single round, he's okay. Don't lose focus or that guy will pick us all off. As the Mark V nears the central dome, the two remaining Gundams continue to give chase, the Excess and the Zeta Plus being pelted with heavy flak as they near the massive building. Tex telling Ryu that if they don't break off, they're both dead. Ryu, however, isn't listening. He almost has him, but as he gets closer, and Tex continuing to panic, Alice does something unexpected. Hearing Tex's pleas and his words of, if they don't break off, they'll die, Alice, in an act of protection, and in an act of following her growing desire to protect her pilot, immediately takes full control of the Gundam, the AI flying the suit on its own and pulling away from their pursuit of the Mark V. With Ryu unable to even wrestle the controls away from the machine as the Gundam banks away from the dome. With Tex himself following, the man thinking Ryu had given up as the two suits break away from the Capitol Dome's anti-air fire. Ryu is baffled, angered, and furious. He calls the machine up the man punching and smacking the machine's monitor as the stream of annoying words and sounds pour out of the AI's display. As he does this, him not knowing that the AI made the decision to protect him, Alice begins to question what Ryu is shouting. Was it wrong to save their lives? No, it's useless to exchange one's life for the enemies. Were you wrong? Or was I? She questions if it's a sin to make such logical decisions. Negating such instincts can't be a sin, can it? If that statement is true, then is it human to be without meaning? Is being meaningless its own form of meaning? The voice debates whether or not to confirm or deny this fact. And with that concept fresh in her mind, the AI wonders if this is it, these emotions. She wonders if these complex feelings or what it means to be human. With the excess in the Zeta Plus returning, the first day of the Siege of Airs draws to a close, with Task Force Alpha finally establishing their beachhead. As time passes, a whole week goes by. Through continued attacks on Airs, and with mounting pressure from the Federation government, Task Force Alpha and Beta manage to push their way towards the city's central dome, the final battle line just within a kilometer of the main government headquarters. Throughout this time, the new decides have been broadcasting from the city of the battles, 
promoting the heroics of both Ayer's people and the new decides themselves. As the days draw into this next week, many other cities have begun to take notice of the situation, with many people from the lunar cities expressing a desire to join forces. Nevertheless, the battle for Ayer's has reached the city's doorstep. We cut to the mayor's office, and things are falling apart. Their final defensive line has been broken, and many of their forces were wiped out ages ago, with the mayor still trying to command them, despite their forces being completely decimated. Josh and the mayor watch with tired eyes. They haven't slept for days. They watch as their forces' IFF coats continue to disappear from the monitor. Josh asks if any of the other lunar cities have shown any interest in helping them, but the mayor says no. It seems they looked at their idea of a lunar coalition as some kind of joke. As the two brood over the tactical map, an officer comes in with some good news. It seems Von Braun has expressed protests against the Federation, but when the mayor asks if they've taken action against them, the man's happy expression turns to sorrow. No. All they've done is impose some heavy economic sanctions, no forces to come help them. The mayor, saddened, turns to Tosh. He's sorry. They tried so hard, but in the end, it seems the space noids do not support their beliefs. No matter the case, it seems that everyone is just too dependent on the Earth for survival. And so it is, the Earth beeth the one who dictates how we must handle our problems. It seems, with all the losses and defeats, Mayor Pinefield has finally accepted it. Humanity cannot survive without Mother Earth, and whoever is in control of it governs all. The price was too high, but he finally realizes it now. Tosh, as well as this Harden, he didn't expect the ideals of the space noids to be seen as far more noble than their own. After all, they're all human. However, to Tosh, in his eyes, those who live their lives on solid ground should have more pride than space noids. After all, new types are just earthnoids who yearn for space. It is here, though, that Tosh comes to a realization. It was once said that new types are the representation of human evolution, but to Tosh, he now sees that the ones who truly need to change their ways are those who live their lives under the influence of gravity. Yet to him, the ideology of the new types, one that sees those bound by gravity, will never be able to change. That ideology in and of itself is a highly discriminatory way of thinking. Right now, with how history is changing, he sees the space noids as they are acting currently, as being somewhat unable to fully realize and develop the beliefs they preach, and that to him, and the people around him, the new decides, and those who follow them, are the only people who are actually putting in the effort into making their ideals a reality. And with that sentiment, Tosh believes no matter what, he will act as that crucial stepping stone for the rest of mankind. Side note, and this is a personal take, this was the point where I fully began to realize both the tragedy and the hypocrisy of the new decides. Tosh is not wrong in his beliefs, as at this time, Neo Zeon is invading the Earth, but solely because of Haman's vainglorious desires to be seen as the ruler of Zeon, which in a few months will absolutely turn the forces of Axis down the path of civil war that we know they're treading. However, for Tosh, to believe that his actions are the only ones important is his greatest flaw. Tosh himself believes that his cause is a just one, but that everyone should be feeling the same way that he does. So, I don't know if you've noticed, but I really like this story's characters. We have Ryu, who although is beginning to listen to his superiors and beginning to control his anger, is at a point where he's letting his hateful emotions make more dangerous moves in battle. I mean, flying headfirst into anti-aircraft fire to chase down a single opponent with no regard for the safety of your allies isn't a good idea. But regardless, he is still showing growth, even if he's kicking and screaming as he does it. As for Tosh, I've really liked seeing this guy's abilities grow. He begins his arc in the story as being the guy who knows everything and is in control of everything. However, that strategic ability is also a double-edged sword for him, and we're beginning to see how much of a hypocrite he is when shown the failings of his ideology. The man sees his cause as the most righteous despite the fact his forces are not getting help and are being seen by everyone on the outside with a pair of mixed eyes. On one side, they're promoting this coalition to join forces with the moon, but they're also preaching the belief that they want to protect the earth. And to top it all off, they're doing it while the Federation is smashing down their gates and decimating what forces they still have left. Because, I don't know if you've noticed this, 
but in the Federation's eyes, they're literally trying to form a separatist alliance as they do so. So, yeah, this story is very complicated. Anyways, Mayor Pinefield agrees with Tasha's sentiment. It's true. The Space Noids do use their ideology as their tool to place blame and judgment onto the people of Earth. It is discriminatory. However, the people of Ayers have inherited a different belief, one bestowed upon them by their forefathers. For all this time, the people of Ayers have held the belief that things might get better, and that someday mankind can return to the Earth. But the people around them, the Space Noids, they're different. Their longing to return for them has turned to envy. Even with their ability to make such changes, they haven't been able to make lasting progress on the system. The Space Noids themselves act childishly, and they make such comparisons between themselves and those of Earth without open discussion. Pinefield fears what kind of tragedy could happen in the future with such narrow-minded thinkers. If the future of mankind were entrusted to them, he fears what kind of world they would make. And in the end, because of this, he truly looks down upon them, and the parasites that they are. With that statement in mind, Tosh says he will not let them have their way, the two of them nodding with a smile as they both agree they're still not dead yet. If it's going to end for them, they're going to fight till the bitter end. And if that's the case, then let's give them a fight. Let's make some even more painful memories for them as we do it. With the two accepting that they will not be receiving any kind of support from anyone on the outside, and with Task Force Alpha and the Federation surrounding them, Tosh and Kaiser begin to execute their plan of escape. The end times of Air City are approaching, and it seems that Tosh is content with going down with the ship. And with how this story ends, it's going to be quite the explosive conclusion. That marks the end of Part 3. I hope you've enjoyed this series so far, and I hope you stick around for the final two episodes where I dive into the finale. This video took a long time to make, as this battle spans literally five chapters of the book. We aren't even done yet, we still have the final stretch to go. And then, after that, we have four more long chapters after that. However, after the battle for Ayers, we finally get to see the new sides become desperate. Yes, they are trying to escape once again, but they can't keep this up forever. Once this battle finishes, we'll finally see what this was all building up to. As for Alice, I like that she's beginning to be given more agency in the story. Having her save Ryu's life by taking control of the S Gundam is a definite big step in her own character development. And with four-ish chapters left, we'll get to see what her journey into learning what it means to be human eventually builds up towards. Anyways, that'll be it for this video. Tune in next time where I go into Gundam Settle Part 4 and Tosh Cray's final backup plan. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and make sure you're caught up with my videos. And this is Gaia Gaius, signing off. Bye!